thank you everyone for taking the time to join us in our second virtual NYC Tableau user group meeting. We've got two presentations today for y'all. Um, just a quick reminder, I know a lot of the register registries, I guess. Um, this is their first Tableau user group. So we host these about once every couple months. We used to do them in person, obviously, and now we've switched to the virtual method, which has worked pretty smoothly still. Um, but essentially, we're trying to bring members from the, the Tableau community together so that we can connect, we can share knowledge. Uh, one of the great parts of Tableau and the community is just the collaboration within everyone that's using it. Uh, and Tableau user groups are a really nice breeding ground for that collaboration and getting to know others that are doing similar work, but maybe at different companies. Um, and hopefully we can inspire everyone along the way. So today, after my little short intro here, we're going to be talking about the new Tableau data model. We've got Tyler's iceberg. And then uh, we've got a deep dive on an IronBiz submission uh, that Emily did. And she will also then flow right into everyone's favorite section, the Tableau lightning tips. Um, I'll share out these slides on our social media. So on Twitter and in LinkedIn so that you can get access to any of these links um, in this slide deck. But uh, if you want to be updated, um, be sure to subscribe to that user group, follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn. There's a couple different groups where we post all the updates about upcoming meetings. Um, quick little highlight on what's happening in the Tableau community. The Tableau conference just happened. Uh, if you missed that, it's okay because the sessions are on demand and you can rewatch them now. So if you go to that uh, URL that I have linked there, you can watch all of the sessions back. There were some pretty cool ones. Um, Emily's gonna be talking today about IronViz. She'll go into more detail about what that is if you don't know what it is. But if you're inspired by the work that she's sharing and you wanna see what other people were able to create for that, this is a good link uh, where you can go and see a blog post highlighting all of the great submissions and the winners of that. We are always looking for folks interested in hosting or speaking. Uh, you know, once next year rolls around, hopefully we'll be able to get back into hosting these live. But in the meantime, if you're interested in speaking, we have a form here with that hyper URL that you can fill out. Um, and so we're always looking for folks to be contributing to these user groups. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler to start sharing and tell you all about the Tableau data model. All right, thank you, Jacob. I'm gonna share my screen here, one second. All right, can everyone see this guy? Perfect. All right, hey guys, my name is Tyler Zeisberg. Uh, I work for Coenterprise. We are a data analytics consulting firm. Uh, I have two years of Tableau desktop experience creating dashboards for a number of clients over a variety of different industry verticals. I wrote a blog post uh, highlighting key factors uh, of the new Tableau data model that came available in 2020.2. It's on our company website, go check it out. Um, I'm originally from Long Island, grew up there, went to Ohio State, studied information systems. Um, this is my first uh, position out of school. Uh, love it, w love working with Tableau, um, love working with clients. Uh, and my hobbies are golfing, watching football, and listening to music. Um, so that's pretty much a little uh, background of who I am. Um, what I'm going to be speaking about today is the two new Tableau data model that was available in 2020.2. So with that being said, uh, what I'm going to dive deep into today is I'm going to show you an example of what the Tableau data model is, some additional features that you may not know exist inside the Tableau data, new, new, data, uh, new Tableau data model, uh, and then I'm going to do a little example uh, with the bookstore data set that came out with the beta. And then we'll open it up to some questions. So 
So in this first section, I'm going to be talking about what the new Tableau data model is, why it's important, and a little background of how things have changed since previous versions. Let me, one second. There we go. So everyone knows what a row level join is. You know, when you take two tables, table one, table two, and you create that third join. So for this one that we're looking for on the screen here, it's showing an inner join. So as you could see, you take the, uh, the state from both tables, you combine it into that third table. We're all probably used to doing this, whether it was in Tableau or SQL or any other uh, data visualization software. Uh, and you, there are a few different types of joins here. Again, we're looking at row level joins. Um, as you could see in that third table, it could get problematic if you wanted to do a little analysis on population. Because uh, as you could see, the population is being repeated for every row. So for instance, California, you'd be getting 160 million when the actual population is 40 million. And for New York, you get 40 million when the actual population is 20 million. Uh, we've all experienced this. This can be dealt with with LOD expressions, fixed expressions. Um, but at the end of the day, you still need to use those LOD expressions to do analysis on this. The next type of join that I'm going to be talking about is the aggregate join. So uh, we can aggregate on the state level to get rid of what we, what I was just explaining before, where the population it was being uh, duplicated. So as you could see in this current example, we aggregated on the event type. So there were four events for California, two events for New York. When we do a little analysis, we actually get the right population level. And we can be doing this uh, through a variety of ways, like I mentioned, with LOD expressions or through blending. And I'm going to hit on that in the next slide here. So before 2020.2, there was a data source uh, that was created by two physical tables. And you get that logical table like you see in the left, uh, in the left uh, table there, example. Uh, with aggregate joins, you're taking two logical tables. Uh, two logical Tableau data sources, a primary and secondary source. And we've all seen that chain before, that orange chain right at the top here that shows data blending. Uh, so we essentially take the primary and secondary source. We aggregate on whatever dimensions we want to see. We combine it into one visualization. And obviously, we're all pretty experienced with blending, I would hope. If you're not, uh, as we all know, blending is pretty, uh, it's hard. It's a slow process. It's a tidy process, and it's not a very efficient process. Uh, and that's essentially where relationships come in here. So a data, data source can combine multiple tables at different levels of detail. Logical tables can be made up with as many physical tables as you want. The main difference between the relationship and a traditional join is the join happens when you create the visualization, and it doesn't change. It does it before you even get to that uh, visualization layer. Whereas with a relationship, it's created during the visualization process. And it can change depending on what dimensions and measures are included in that sheet. Uh, and then Tableau is smart enough, the data engine is smart enough, that it aggregates on the necessary measures before doing that join. Because the join is created during the visualization process, it only uses the tables that are actu actually necessary for that specific visualization. Uh, and as you could see in here, the, you could have as many logical tables, and we're going to show a little example of what this actually looks like when you build it out in the data model. Uh, in the new data model, each related table maintains its native level of detail versus in the old way where each table or join, uh, which causes that duplication like we initially saw in that first example. When we build our viz, uh, we can, uh, we wouldn't have to use those uh, overly complicated LODs now because Tableau can smartly or intelligently define what we want aggregated without us even really knowing when we pull in those dimensions and measures into the view. So as you can see on the left-hand side, we have that data model with all of our physical tables like we we're all used to. But in that new model after 2020.2, you could have multiple logical tables connected to each other by that little relationship in the middle here. And all of those together create one data source. 
So here at Co-Enterprise, uh, I made a back to business dashboard. Uh, this was early on in the COVID, uh, I guess, time frame back in April or March. Uh, and we essentially created a dashboard that helps stores reopen their businesses by following a number of steps in an area. So we found a sample data set um, that allowed stores to check off yes or no whether the step was completed, you know, steps like is there signage in place? Is there glass panels? You know, all the things that we're kind of used to at this point. Uh, and we created this dashboard so they could tra track whether those stores are reopening in a timely fashion, which stores were opening, and if they meet the guidelines stated by the government, uh, you know, their local government and the national government. Uh, and we actually used the new Tableau data model for this dashboard. And I'm going to show you how we did that. So, this is a little screenshot of the Excel sheet that we used uh, for the back end where all the data is stored. So as you can see, we have a list of all the counties, cities, all the stores, uh, the store occupancy. And if you see column V to column AE, those are our Boolean questions. The questions that you know the store could check off yes or no whether that step was completed. So one thing that I want to highlight on is if we were to put this Excel sheet straight into Tableau and then we wanted to find, you know, what's the store occupancy? You know, as we all know, Tableau doesn't like wide data and we would actually need to pivot this data. So when we were do the store occupancy after pivoting this data, so let's say we were going to pivot on those, uh, those Boolean questions so we can get a yes or no value for each question for each store. Once we pivot those, as we all know, the store occupancy is going to duplicate like we saw in the original example. So for the, you know, the second row here, we would get 42 times the five questions that were pivoted. And obviously we would get row duplication, which we wouldn't want. Uh, so we could solve this with an LOD expression or we could just use the new Tableau data model. So let's see what that looks like. So, this is the Tableau data model that we created. So the Excel sheet is called cellular stores. Uh, and then what we actually did is we broke off the specific things into new uh, physical logical tables. So the checklist, which is just a bunch of those questions, we actually took that from the existing data source uh, and plugged it into a, we pivoted it and then plugged it into a new data source. Now it has that relationship. And we did that with a few different other things such as you know, when the store dates are opening. Uh, and, you know, with this data model, the duplication on the sum of store occupancy does not occur. And I can tell you that from a fact, and I'm just going to show you exactly how that works. So we're going to dive deep into the what this checklist table looks like here. So these are the questions, the yes, no Boolean questions that I was referring to a little while ago, you know, to help the stores track where in the opening process they are. So that's what that pivot table looks like. As you can see, it looks a little different than the normal Excel spreadsheet that we were looking at before. We could just use this store, uh, the sum of store occupancy, and we get that the store occupancy is 868, which is in fact the correct number. Now I'm gonna show you what that, uh, what that calculation would look like if we were using the old data model. So the old data model, we have that one uh, Excel spreadsheet. We're still going to pivot like we did in the previous example. We're going to use that same calculation that I just showed you. But now we get 6,076, which is not the correct number. And like I mentioned before, this is because those rows are being duplicated for every single question. It's obviously not the correct number. Uh, so what we would need to do is we would need to create an LOD fix it on the store number, and then get what that store occupancy, and that's how we get the correct value. This we're all pretty familiar with. So why did we want to do it this way? So the reason we wanted to do it this way is because if you remember, if we go back to that Excel file, it's really easy for the stores to input the data that they have. It's all in Excel, nice and easy. Everything's in one row. They could just check off yes or no uh, for the Boolean questions, type any information in. It's an easy way to track it. But as we all know, the easiest way for a user to input data is not the best way to visualize it. And that's why we did it this way. We also reduced the duplicate rows in the data model without having to use the LOD like I just showed. 
And it's actually easier to manage the separate tables with this star and snowflake schema that is being shown on the right side here. So now I'm gonna go into a little bit about some advanced features that come with the new Tableau data model. So when you create that new Tableau data model and you do those relationships between the tables, you get the option to click on performance options. These performance options are things like cardinality and referential integrity. So for cardinality, uh, you could do many-to-many -many relationships, uh, you know, one-to-many relationships. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with those, I would imagine. And then for referential integrity, you could either choose some records match between the tables or all records match between the tables. Uh, and I could show you why this is important in a second. So Tableau will automatically use the information set uh, that you could see in the performance options. This is the normal default settings. Um, and it sets the referential integrity to some records match. Uh, and we'll go into that in a second. Um, this allows Tableau to make simpler queries. Uh, when we change the cardinality, and that's what we're going to go into right now. So in this example, we have sales table and we have a product catalog table. If we let Tableau decide the refer referential integrity, meaning some records match, the behind the scenes SQL query that is being displayed on the screen there is what's actually happening. If we say all records match, which means assume referential integrity, as you could see, that inner join is being dropped from the table, which essentially means that, you know, because all the records match, it doesn't really need to do that inner join anymore. And because that SQL query is actually smaller, it's able to, uh, you know, it's able to run that query a lot faster, thus providing a better performance dashboard. Um, unfortunately, you do need to be careful when you select this option because if you say all records match and they don't within the database, um, it could produce inaccurate results and you're just gonna get a bunch of random data that doesn't align for your analysis. So when would the new data model be most useful to you? So if we wanted to increase performance in a workbook, uh, the new data model is gonna be a lot better. The reason why is, as we all know, things like blending, it slows down the workbook. It's a very uh, annoying feature to use for the most part. And we want to try and avoid it most of the time. And I think most people would agree with me on that. Uh, and then second, you know, when we were looking at those performance options, things like referential integrity and cardinality, uh, as we just saw in the previous slide, uh, it increases the performance because you have smaller queries. Second part is, unnecessary overcomplicated use of custom SQL queries. So if we were using custom SQL queries to create joins and create analysis before the data gets into Tableau, we don't really need to use that anymore because we have that new relationship feature. Uh, the third, like we all already know, we limit the number of LODs or blending techniques to aggregate data correctly. So like I showed you before in the first example, we needed to create an LOD expression to get the correct number of store occupancy. Uh, but in the new model, we don't really need to do that and we still get the correct answer. Um, and then it allows flexibility in the back end of the visualization to change. And that is referring to, uh, like I mentioned, when Tableau decides whether it's an inner join or a left join, it's all dependent on the dimensions and measures you bring into the view. So when wouldn't we want to use the data model? So unfortunately, there is still a case for the blending uh, within a, you know, uh, a Tableau dashboard. So this use case is if you had two related published data sources uh, and they're currently being stored on Tableau server, but the user does not have access to the underlying data or model, this would be a use case for when you want to blend. You can't edit the relationships in a published data source and you can't define relationships between published data sources. Limiting factors of the new Tableau data model, tables with a lot of unmatched values across the relationships. So uh, Tableau would not be able to pick up exactly what you the relationship would be if you have a lot of unmatched values. And that kind of goes back to 
the cardinality and referential integrity that I was mentioning before. Um, dirty tables can make multi-table analysis more complex. So a dirty table is a table that wasn't created with a well-structured model in mind and can contain a mixture of measures and dimensions in multiple tables, which actually causes uh, a bunch of issues when dealing with the new Tableau data model. And then the last one is data source filters can limit how Tableau handles removing unnecessary joins from a visualization. So data source filters, uh, which filter out specific rows, may cause issues when you have your referential integrity set to all rows match, um, because it won't match across the tables if there are a few different rows missing. So with that being said, uh, I'm gonna do a little demo here of a Tableau uh, data set. And one second. Let me just pull it up here. So this is the uh, sample bookstore data set that came with the beta of 2020.2. And you all have access to it. It's on the Tableau website. I uh, highly encourage you to go check it out. So right now, we are looking at the old version of Tableau. This is actually 2019.3. And then I'm going to do the same exact thing in 2020.2 and show you how it's a little different. So this is a bookstore. We have four different tables. Uh, you know, we have the book table, which just has a bunch of books in it. The edition table, which has a little bit more information about, you know, uh, what edition the book is. Uh, and then we have the publisher and the sales for quarter one. You know, pretty self-explanatory things. So we're tasked with creating a dashboard for a bookstore. They want to track their sales. Um, this is a viz that we made for them. We could track, you know, how many orders we have per month. And one of the questions that we get asked is, we want to know what's the average pages per, per publishing house uh, for a specific publishing house. So these are the four publishing houses that we have. Uh, so we want to find what the average is. So we would think that we would just plug in you know, pages. We take the average. That's the number we get. We go back to our client, and we say, you know, this is what we get. How does this look? And they go, it doesn't look right at all. So now we have to go and figure out exactly what's going on here. So we're just going to filter down to a specific uh, publishing house here, and we're going to drag some dimensions in to see where this goes wrong. So just to speed things up, I know that because we brought the sales data in, we could have multiple sales for multiple books or multiple sales for the same book. So if we actually bring sales data into here, and we change it to uh, an exact date, and we change it to a discrete value. As you could see, there are a lot of dates for each book. So what is essentially happening here is each time that a book is sold, uh, no matter what book it is within this publishing house, it's affecting the average pages for the, the publishing house because we have pages with multiple different books that are bought multiple different times on multiple different days. So that is essentially what is affecting our overall uh, average number for pages. So I'm just gonna take this out and I'll show you how to get the correct value. So now that we know that this value is not correct, how do we fix it? Well, we go back to LODs. So we take this LOD here that I already created and we just take what is the max pages per ISBN, which is essentially what is the max pages per book. And if we drag that onto the viz here and we change it to a discrete value, we could see, and we change it to an average because that's what we're looking at, we could see that the actual value here is 476.122. And I could tell you that that is closer to the correct value. It's not exactly the correct value, and I'll show you that in a second why it's not. But I'm going to switch over to the new Tableau data model in version 2020.2, and I'm essentially going to do the same thing. So once again, I'm going to go over here. We brought in that book table. We brought in the edition table. We brought in the publisher table. We brought in the sales table. And I left all these performance options like I was just talking about before exactly the way they come. So many to many cardinality and the referential integrity is gonna stay the same. So pretty self-explanatory, nothing too crazy. 
So again, we bring in our publishing house. Now I'm gonna bring in pages like we did before. I'm gonna change it to an average and I'm gonna change it to discrete. We're gonna filter it down to this guy. And you could see that the average pages is 473.43. And I could tell you with 100% confidence that this is the correct number. And you could see we didn't need the LOD expression to get there. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, very easy. Uh, and now I'm gonna tell you why that 476 number that we saw in the previous model was not correct. So if I switch back over here, I'm gonna take this guy off just so we could look at this one a little bit better. So 476.122, we did our fixed LOD. Why is this not the right number? Well, if you remember, when we originally brought in all these tables, we did inner join. So we actually did an inner join on the sales table. But what I could tell you is, if we were to switch over to the sheet here and essentially go through all the marks here, Not seeing it now, but uh, essentially what is happening here is because we did that inner join and we're joining on ISBN from the sales, uh, from the edition and the bookstore and joining on the ISBN for the sales table, that means that there has to be a record for each ISBN. What I could tell you is that's not the case. It, there's actually some missing from the ISBN from the sales table either because that sells, uh, you know, there wasn't a book sold or there was a book sold that wasn't in that book table, uh, which actually causes chaos. So if we were just to switch this from an inner join to a left join, uh, which means that it's actually looking at all of the ISBNs from the, the book table. And then we go back to our original thing. Now that we see that we can get that 473.43 number, which when we go back to the client, they actually tell us that's the right number. Um, so what's going on here? So, you know, Tableau in the new data model in 2020.2 realized that there wasn't a matching record, and but it knew what we were actually trying to find, and it actually just did that left join for us without actually telling us, um, which, you know, could save us a lot of time and hassle but when we're doing QA for clients or our own dashboards in the future. Um, this is just an example of you know, why we should be using this new data model, some of the capabilities of it. Uh, and I, hopefully you guys understood this. If you have any questions, throw it in the chat. Um, that is the, uh, the example that I have for you. I'm gonna switch back to this guy now. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, throw it in the chat here. Uh, but that's all the time for me. Uh, and I'll pass it over to the next person. Thanks guys. It looks like we do have one question. Uh, yeah, is it in the chat? It's in the chat. So it's about uh, extracting the data and if that would be a concern. Um, right, so this. yeah. So hi, how does extracts work with the new data model? Right now I have a couple of data sources blended together, but separate extracts, would they all need to be in one extract? Would size be a concern? Yeah, so essentially what you're gonna wanna do with this is the best way to approach this would be to create, uh, you would want to create that data model within one extract. Because I would assume that when you go to publish it to server, whoever is using that is not going to be able to edit that underlying data model. Um, so when you create that extract, you're want, going to want to create it within the new data model itself. Uh, would size be a concern? Uh, that's a hard question to, to answer. Um, you know. Uh, as we all know, you know, extracts could take a while to be created depending on how many rows of data you have. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer that question. Uh, I believe if you were to take an extract within the new Tableau data model, it would be roughly the same size if you were to take the extract uh, in the way that you're currently doing it. So I don't believe it would be uh, an issue for you. I know that during the presentation, Anne raised her hand. Um, if you had a question, Anne, um, go ahead and pop it in the chat. Otherwise, 
um, yeah, feel free to, to continue asking questions and we can maybe respond to them at the end. Um, but thank you so much, Tyler, for that. It's very informative. I actually haven't used that new model much, but um, looking forward to taking advantage of some of those features. Um, next, we have Emily uh, de Padua, and she's going to take us through some of her work um, for the Iron Viz competition this year. And if you have questions for her throughout the presentation, there's actually a Q&A feature at the bottom as well as the chat. Um, if you throw your questions in the Q&A, it'll be easy for us to monitor the individual questions and respond to those. Um, so yeah, let's uh, go ahead and turn it over to her. Thanks again, Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So give me one second to transition in. Okay, present, present. Okay, cool. Give it a second. Okay, can everyone see it? Yeah, cool. Um, as Jacob mentioned, um, you know, if, as I go through my talk, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, so I'm just going to dive in. So uh, just a quick refresher because um, to kind of level the playing field. Um, what is IronViz? IronViz is an annual data visualization competition that ignites and showcases the power of the Tableau community. So it happens roughly every year. Um, your, your entry is judged based off through, through a panel of esteemed judges. And the criteria for, your, for the scoring is three things, analysis, design, and storytelling. Um, the Iron Vis finalists are determined through qualifier rounds to compete in the final live visiting event, um, usually in front of a massive live audience with thousands more watching online. The final Iron Vis contenders are given 20 minutes to cook up a show-stopping viz, tantalize, sizzle, and reign supreme live for the grand prize on the Iron Vis stage at Tableau Conference. Uh, like many things, uh, Tableau Iron Viz looked a little different for 2020. So instead of having three separate global qualifier contests, there was actually only one global qualifier contest to determine the three finalists to make it to the, to the championship round at Tableau Conference-ish. Um, as Jacob mentioned, it, um, you can see it completely online for free. You can catch the recording. Um, you can even watch the Iron Viz championship online to experience the magic. Uh, personally, it's a total nail biter. Uh, I was very stressed while watching it. So definitely recommend seeing the amazing work that the three finalists ended up making. I kind I gave a little shout out to the three fizzes, um, but if you want to find out who won, you gotta you gotta watch it. So um, so yeah, but for the sake of my talk, I'm gonna talk primarily about the Iron Miss qualifier round. Um, so the qualifier round, again, it was the only qualifier round for Iron Viz this year. It ran from June 30 through August 4th. The theme was health and wellness. And for this challenge, you could use any public data set of your choosing as long as it related to the theme of health and wellness. Uh, this year was also unique because there was a record number of Iron Viz entries. So there were 372 Iron Viz entries across multiple countries. And of that 372, 86% were submitted by first time applicants. Um, I was one of them. And again, even though there are some slight changes to the format, similar to previous years, entries were scored uh, based on analysis, design, and storytelling. Uh, the, the, and then from there, they went through first and initial uh, judging from the community judges that were sourced from the Tableau community. Those community judges scored all 372 entries, which is a feat in itself. And, um, and then from there, they determined of the 372, which were the top 10 and advanced them to a second round of scoring by a different set of guest judges. And this second round of judging, uh, the guest judges would then score uh, the top 10 uh, with the top three scores um, moving on to the virtual Irish championship. Um, and, I, I, and my, the visit I'm gonna show you guys th throughout this talk have made it to the top 10. So um, here's my viz. I'd like to say the pictures don't do it quite justice because it's highly interactive. Um, it's called All By Myself. Yes, it's a reference to Celine Dion. Uh, and I later learned Eric Carmen came first. So that's my generation pop culture right there. Um, 
kind of, I'm going to go through a lot of features, but, you know, just a brief overview. Um, it's a, it's basically a story about living alone during COVID-19. Um, I documented basically my one woman quarantine between March and July. So I do go a little explicit when you first look through it, you know, there's a lot of information about like, what's this about? Uh, some information about quarantine alone and and about the data. I really, particularly because this was such a self-reported data set, I really wanted to have that transparency with my audience. Um, from there is the heart of the visualization, which is this radial chart. Uh, the shape of the dots in the radial chart and the color indicate my, um, whether or not I was alone, in this case, in this view, is physically alone. Um, and then also you can't, uh, and then the size, like in terms of if it's a really big circle, a little small circle, lets you know my emotions. I ultimately ended up tracking my emotions, my, so my general mood for that day, activities I was doing, occasional thoughts, just my general mental health while going through this really particular time in our lives. Um, from there, there's also three additional views. Um, you could toggle through here and I'll go through it in the next slide but there's also different features. So I have a user guide, a resource for if you're feeling alone, to finally an activity section all the way at the bottom. Um, but there are these two, there's one particular feature I wanna start off and talk about first is um, I have these buttons here. And if you toggle through, you go through different lenses of my definition for alone. So here's the final view. So in the initial view, I was, look, I was defining being alone as being physically alone. So was I physically alone? as in no one was around to give me a hug or handshake. Um, and as you saw, of the 141 days I reported, I was reporting this, I was doing this reporting, uh, only 90%, nearly 90% of those days were spent physically alone. But then when you account for when I was like, yes, physical company, but also virtual company. So when I was getting phone calls from friends, doing happy hour Zooms, uh, doing, uh, having FaceTime calls with friends and family, I'm actually only spending like 30% of my time living alone, um, which I think is so wholesome. And uh, one of the main reasons why this viz became so interactive because I wanted that interactivity to be a part of the storytelling because that was basically the way I shifted my thinking. When I created this viz, I was kind of sad about the state of, the, the state of everything that's going on, really fixating on being physically alone. Um, but in doing this viz and slicing the data slightly different, shifting my definition for being alone, I kind of look at this totally different. You know, yeah, 90% of my days during that time were physically alone, but in the grand scheme of things, it was actually 30% you were, I was actually alone. Um, from there, after a person kind of toggles through, um, you then move on to the activities analysis session. So I tracked uh, 20 unique, common, uh, recurring activities done in the span of 141 days. Um, and I kind of give a brief analysis on what was my most reported activity, what type of activity was, um, and that kind of wraps up my vids. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to go a lot more deeper. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop into the chat, um, into the Q&A and pop in questions, and I'll save them for the end. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to cover in this talk about my, uh, you know, my design dashboard confessional, I'm going to talk about me because as you guys can kind of figure out, the data talks a lot about my life. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you at least the the essential things I want audiences need to know when you're consuming my vids, uh, the data behind it, um, which we'll and I'll talk about where that data came from, the inspiration, um, because the inspiration was a big part of my guidance and direction process, both the expectation and process and how it actually happened. And then um, I'm gonna highlight four key features. There's a lot of parts in the viz as I kind of showed you all. Um, so I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna try and stick to just these four main key features that were some of my favorites. I mean, I love the whole viz, but these are like the four main ones that I'll highlight. And then I'll wrap up with learned lessons. So yeah, let's get into this. So, hi. <laughs> I'm Emily. Um, I am one of the nearly 23.5 million American women that currently live alone. 
Uh, due to COVID-19 stay-at-home orders, I am currently working remotely. Um, I do not have any pets, but please ask me about my plants. <laughs> I live in the United States in the New York City, New Jersey area, and mental health is very important to me. I made sure, particularly in the beginning, like in the about this viz section, I made sure to really call out these parameters about my life. You know, when you're reporting really personal data set, it's important for your end user to have context on where you are coming from. Um, I know, like, I know I'm privileged to be able to live and uh, comfortably live um, and work remotely from home. I know that's not everyone's situation. So having that kind of explicitly explained in as your readers are going through and consuming your viz um, was really important, a real big part of why I laid out like, these are the things you need to know about me as you go through this viz. Um, so yeah, so about the data, because we love data. So the data is a, is, comes from this app that I use called Dalio. Dalio is a freemium mood tracking bullet journal app. I have been using Dalio as part of my daily journal routine since April 2018. How many days does that mean? As of today, I have used Dalio for 921 days straight. So, um, it's so far the only daily journal method that has stuck. Um, this isn't, I'm not sponsored or anything, but like, if anyone wants to talk about Dalio, I'm a big fan. Um, I did include pictures of the app because I believe one of the reasons why I liked it so much was they do a lot of fun mood chart analysis. Um, so it's a fun, it's a fun app. It visualizes your mood. It mimics the bullet journal trend. Um, that's really popular. It's super visual. Um, yeah, I have the premium version because I've been using this forever, but it's available on the Apple App Store and on Google Play. But I'm done my daily plug. So um, to talk mostly about the data, as you can tell with that 921 day streak, I was sitting on this Viz for a really long time and not necessarily the Viz itself, right? Like pandemic started in March. I started working remotely from home in March, but I've been sitting on this data set for nearly two years, no, over two years um, by this point. So, and I think sometimes when you're working with data, especially if it's personal data, something that I've learned is sometimes you just have to cook and wait until there's inspiration. And up until I started doing this viz, I just didn't have inspiration until I got inspiration. <laughs> um, I discovered Jeff Platner's Kobe Bryant viz on Twitter through the data fan hashtag. This was the viz that was my light bulb moment for all, all by myself. As you can see, it has that radial chart. I was immediately gravitated to it because of, you know, you can see it visually kind of the trends. Um, there was this awesome uh, recap of kind of each of the individual rows, but then you could color code each of the individual days for, in this case, years um, to give you a little more context. It was my light bulb moment. And I think, um, I think sometimes when you're working with, you're doing personal projects or you're doing something, um, something new, having that inspiration is such a great guidance. So I had my inspiration, I had my data. What was next? I started, I started the process. I had the idea from Jeff Platner's work. I, I was really into it. I was like, oh my God, I think I finally know what I can do with this giant daily data set I've been sitting on for years and just have, haven't figured out what to do. And in theory, right, here's the process for creating this. You have an idea, you brainstorm slash sketch, you research slash educate when you're trying to do something you don't know how to do in Tableau, you build, 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 uh, get feedback, and then those past three steps kind of dance around each other depending on what's going on. And then finally you're like, I'm done, yay, we've done it. Um, so that's the theory, right? That, this is the expectation. This was the actual process. <laughs> this is the actual process. So I started, I was, in some ways I was fortunate, not necessarily for the subject of the viz, but in terms of the idea, the, vi the idea for this viz came before Iron Viz was announced. Um, and in some ways, as someone who is a first time applicant, as someone who's always been kind of shy to share um, and really be like, 
kind of go for it went on Tableau Public, um, I think that ended up working to my favor. So I had the idea for the Viz way uh, maybe a week before Iron Viz the theme was announced. So you can see that I started on June 23. I started building it. I made it very similar to Jeff Platner's work. I started getting feedback and was like, okay, this is cool. Like maybe I'll get like this of the day or something. Like this will be fun. Um, it was like supposed to be like a weekend side project. And then a couple of days later, uh, around, I think I learned about the 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 um, the theme on July first. I learned about the theme and I went, wait a minute, like this could just be the I could totally use this viz to enter Iron Viz, which is something I've been wanting to do for quite a while. Um, I've always been a fan of Iron Viz. I've always been a fan of the work that comes out of it, and I just hadn't found the inspiration or the spark to try it. Um, so as you see, though not to go, you know, give you the full narration of my process. I do have a lot of funny stories from it though. Um, you see though that that six kind of, that six steps construct where, um, you know, it wasn't quite linear. There was a lot of fluidity that went. I'd get an idea, but sometimes I'd get an idea while in the middle of doing, building another idea. I'd do a lot of studying while also sketching, um, sometimes feedback, would spark another idea. It was very much fluid. Um, and but I want you to also note that I took a lot of breaks. Um, you know, you can ignore before July, right? Because I didn't know it was going to be for Iron Biz. But after I got the idea to use it for Iron Biz, I took like three days, four days not to do Iron Biz. I did, and I was just casually working on my biz at night um, or like an hour over the course of a month. I don't know if that works for everyone. That's what worked for me, um, just given everything going on. <laughs> but that I, at least for me, when I was first entering and stuff, I, I, I always had this misconception that everyone just did Iron Viz and their and these amazing visits you see on Twitter, like over the course of like a weekend <laughs> or like over the course of like two or three days. And I want to say that like you can you can take your time and work on something. Like sometimes ideas have to cook. Just the way that I had to cook and work on this data for a long time, I also had to cook on iterate. I was This whole process was incredibly iterative. Um, so cool, so once again, here's the viz. Now that you kind of know, that's where it all led up. All of, um, I did have a couple of freak outs leading up to the deadline, but I didn't make the deadline. So that's all that, ma that matters. Um, so yeah, um, so here's the biz. Again, I'm just gonna walk through a couple key features about it. I'm gonna cover a lot, I'm gonna cover a lot of the radial chart, some of the hidden containers, a lot, some of the interactions, and then um, also the activities recap. Highly recommend, um, not just because it's my work, but I, um, you know, the pictures don't necessarily do it justice because by nature it's supposed to be incredibly interactive. So um, if you're game, if you like this talk or whatever, like that's what I say. But I'm gonna start talking about the main parts of this viz. So first off is the radial chart. Um, this is, I said this earlier, but this radial chart was the heart of this visualization. The story is in the interaction as I described, right? I went through I went through a kind of transformation on my own in viewing this time in my life. First, I was looking at it as like, oh, man, like I'm just like 90% of the time physically alone in this apartment to looking at it and changing my definition for alone and having a total shift in my mindset. Um, and I really, I particularly liked the way this viz comes out, particularly this radial chart, because if you toggle, you it gives a highlight for each of the day. Yeah, you can see everything from a 30,000 foot view. You know, you see that the pink hearts happen not as often as the blue hearts. But if you, you could also, um, as you see in the viz, you can toggle and kind of hover over it to learn more. Um, I kept that interactivity, which later would inform a lot of the parts of the viz. Um, if you toggle through, you can toggle through the different slices. Days physically alone, days virtually alone, and days actually alone. What, and each of those slides gives a different story. This is a viz with all three views side by side. I didn't necessarily want this for, um, at, for the viz um, itself because I wanted you to go through the, the thought process I went through when you're going through the viz. Um, but you can see, right, like it's all about definition. <laughs> um, and and um, 
something that's kind of missed here, but um, not so much in on Tableau Public is if you hover over each of the days, you see a lot of different customizations, again, for the data and for the views that we're looking through. Um, so yeah, moving on. I'm gonna talk about the tooltips because they were basically, they were a lot. I went kind of bananas on tooltips. Um, I was inspired by bullet journals and I used tooltips as a way to give each day its own spotlight. Um, the vis uh, these mood boards, this, like, this mood bar over here and these activities are actually uh, separate, vis uh, separate worksheets that are vis and tooltips. Uh, I'm gonna later show you during lightning tips how to make this, um, this mood bar. Um, but one of the fun ways I, one of the fun ways in storytelling for this viz was I was able to customize each viz in such a way that you can hide, that I can hide special Easter eggs and different like things for people to learn if they really want to go through the viz. Um, as you can see, you know, um, there's a lot of things that change um, that are customized and it's customized based off the view that you're looking at. Um, yeah, I don't know how many how many little customizations I made in my tooltips, so please don't ask me because I don't know. But I know it was a lot because <laughs> I went kind of bananas. Um, moving on, so I then created this activities analysis. I like to call it my love for simple bar charts. I segmented the 20 unique reported activities that I mentioned earlier in the tooltips. I segmented them out into three distinct groupings. While, and from a design point of view, while the radial chart featured a very rounded aesthetic, right? It was arches, um, there's hearts which are round, there's circles for when there's no social interactions, even the connecting line chart was rounded. I wanted that to be a rounded aesthetic, but when someone is viewing the activities analysis, I wanted them to know at least like subtly that it was a separate, um, that it was a separate, it was a separate data, it was a separate experience, which is why all of these are incredibly very square. Um, and even in the layout, you know, I tried to keep it very rectangular, very rigid versus in the main radial chart is it's very round and fluid. This is one of my favorites, it's the navigation guide. So if you go up to the top left, you see a how to read guide, if you click it, a hidden container will pop out and then show you how to read this. So you'll see here, day not alone is for days with a heart. Blue, um, this was a day that was a day alone across all different views. I give you a little legend. I give you the start of the day, start of the month, when day one was versus day, the last day recorded um, because I, I didn't start social, I didn't start um, working from home remotely until um, March 13th, until March 13th. This is a fun one. Um, there's two ways to do this. You know, you could screenshot it and make it a, and, and that could be your annotation. I've done that before using PowerPoint, but for this one, because I was going through so many iterations, I knew a screenshot wasn't going to work. I, um, I, I decided to make the how to read guide completely out of a floating hidden tile container that contained, um, different, that contain different mini containers within it. So this arrow is a image inside of another container that's connected to this day alone annotation. It's, it's a little, it's a lot of investment, but it does save you quite a bit, particularly, um, you know, it's a, it's a choice. If you, if you know the viz is going to be more static, you, you're probably going to be fine with the screenshot. But if you're like me and was iterating a lot over the course of a month, then, um, then this might be a route for you. It's a lot on the upfront, but then uh, it's a lot of time and investment on the upfront, but once you have it set, unless you do a massive makeover, that's the, that's the viz. Um, so yeah, it's just a, depending on how you're gonna allocate your time. Um, so yeah, so I'm nearing to the end of the talk. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk through some of my key learned lessons. I learned a lot by doing this viz. Um, and I hope you learned a lot by kind of letting me kind of go on my spiel about this viz. But there were a couple key things that I took away from. Um, first is that the end user for your visualization about your own self-reported data can change. And I say that because when I was making this viz, I was kind of making it for me. And I kind of was like, I'm gonna use Iron Viz to get, make this viz like the best that I could. But in general, like, I was kind of thinking about making it for me. Um, but the end, but 
as I was going through the iteration process, I learned that actually there can be multiple end users, especially for a self-reported data set. Um, towards the end, I ended up showing this to my childhood best friend. And while I was iterating over it over the course of July, she was like, I was using this to be my find my friends mood tracker. I was just checking on how you were doing every couple of days. If you were kind of blue, I would call you. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. So um, something to keep in mind if you're going to do self-reported data sets is your end user may not be this, may be, there may be additional end users than what you originally envisioned in your, in the beginning of the project. Um, please take a break. Uh, you, uh, I, this was something I learned was you do not have to do any personal project in one sitting. Just like the way my data had to cook, sometimes ideas have to cook as well. The third one is comparison is the thief of joy. You do not have to be like everyone else. Please own your creative voice. And that's something that I will always cherish about this viz. Um, I was kind of in a creative rut before I got into, the, I started this viz. And in some ways, um, doing the Iron Viz gauntlet really taught me what, what was authentically my voice in Tableau. I think sometimes as data analysts, you work so hard to make other, your stakeholders happy, the people consuming your, your, um, your work happy and informed and, and empowered. That's that doing a viz like this, doing something like Iron Viz where you are your own driver's seat is really creatively liberating. Um, it was definitely something for me to kind of take away from something I'll always cherish. And then ultimately, and I'm paraphrasing this, uh, you went from a friend, but you enter Iron Viz for yourself, your growth, to create something, to test yourself, and for fun. The fact that you will learn something new by going through the Iron Viz gauntlet is the win in itself. So yeah, so that's my talk. Um, I'm going to take a couple minutes to kind of go through questions. I know. Uh, we're kind of running, I went a little over, so I'm gonna to try to be super quick before I dive into ne my next section. Um, I'm just gonna answer them out loud here. Uh, thanks for telling us about, this is from Zohar Gilboa. I'm sorry if I'm saying the name wrong. I'm sorry I'm saying your last name wrong. Uh, thanks for telling us about the app. I was very curious. At what point did you decide to create the Viz and did you notice your tracking and journaling change based off of this decision? Great question because that was something I was kind of worried about because originally the Viz was only going to be from March to June and then Iron Viz was announced and I was like I want to I want to do I want to I want to do this Viz for Iron Viz um that was so July it was kind of it was like the level of self-awareness journaling in July there was a level of me critically being like am I actually feeling this way or am I doing this to have a story um I did notice, I did catch a couple of times, like if I had a spread of like being alone in July, I was like, I guess I should try and have a phone call with someone because I at least had the data mapping out <laughs> if I, like the gaps. But it was something that I was trying to be conscious of, particularly in July um, for this fizz. Um, going forward, I mean, I, mean, I didn't know until like, two days ago, I was at a 921 day streak. So I don't think my journaling habits will stop. But um, yeah, I'd say that's kind of the answer to the question. I hope I answered it well. Um, okay, and then, oh, also from Zahar. Uh, also, how different is the final viz from your initial viz? There are a lot of sketch feedback cycles here. So I imagine it's a lot of change. It was. Um, I ended up actually kicking myself kind of towards the end because my data, as Tyler kind of mentioned, Tableau doesn't like data that's really wide and my data was very wide. <laughs> so I was like, during his talk, I started snickering a little bit because I learned really fast what happened. And, and unfortunately it was literally in this last mad dash over the course of two days um, where I learned that the decisions I made at the beginning when creating the data set did not help my viz at the end as much. Um, at the beginning, it was very simple. It was almost, it was so similar to Jeff Platner's work where it was just a radial chart, but then as I'm iterating it, it became a lot more complex. Uh, and, and that complexity came a lot from, uh, that complex, complexity came quite a bit from the customizations and really sticking to my aesthetic. You know, when I was doing feedback also, there were suggestions 
from my wonderful village of people who helped me get to the finish line that I didn't even agree with, or I wasn't like sure, I didn't feel like I wanted to do it, or I would later just not have enough time to do. Um, and that kind of, that kind of then also changed kind of the dress. Um, I'm gonna hop into the chat. I might not catch everyone, so hopefully, so if anyone needs to bump it up, please put it recently. Recording your work on the Daily of Biz on Daily is very meta. Yes, it was. I felt like I was like living a community episode. Um, can you talk more about including your little logos in the tooltip and about the transparent containers? Those aspects were so cool and helpful when exploring your biz. That came from Sam B. Thanks so much, Sam B. Um, the little logos in the tooltips are all individual sheets um, all individual sheets that are Viz and tooltips. And I formatted them in a way where they were, I think they were probably like 50 by 50 sheets. It was like really small. Um, and based off the filter for that day, only certain Viz's would show up. It's absolutely one of the reasons why, and it's something I'm like, I wish I had time to improve. The performance on my Viz is not the best. Because I have like over a hundred sheets because I record like 20, 20, uh, 20 Viz and tooltip sheets for the activities. Um, but that's kind of how it went um, in terms of the logos. And then for the transparent containers, especially at the end, it became a question of it was a lot of like, like I imagine it's like tectonic plates when the earth is moving kind of way where you had to like, I had to place the transparent containers in a way that when one was open, you couldn't see the other ones or they didn't break the, 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 the user experience. And that's something that I learned particularly, and if you're gonna do a, a navigation guide of any shape, similar to the one that I did and do any of those pop-up containers like I did, my advice is really make sure, really try, and I hate saying this because like I hate when people break my work, but actively try to break your work to see if the floating containers can function together. Um, that was something that I really struggled with. Um, okay, last question. Okay, um, from Dennis Apigo, Apigo? I like it. I hope I said it right. I'm sorry if I said, if I said anyone's names wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, Okay, great presentation, dot, dot, dot. Did you learn anything about yourself? Yes, um, I did. And, you know, I, I told you guys, I told you folks about the story of like walking through the experience of, you know, I was really sad. <laughs> I was really, I was kind of sad about the state of the world, the state of things. I was really fixating and about being physically alone to, at the end to, going through and really like reassessing what is my definition of alone. Um, so I learned, I learned a lot. I learned that I was loved uh, in not a cheesy little way. I learned that I was so blessed and loved even in the midst of a tragic global pandemic that even when you're alone, you're actually not as alone as you think you are. Um, I also learned that I, I can make a viz like this. I was really shy. I, um, I was really shy about making something like this. I was really nervous about it being such a personal viz and then really actively choosing to be authentically myself aesthetic wise. Like I like to say I have a feminine aesthetic and I chose feminine colors. Um, and I was really proud to pick a feminine aesthetic because that's me. So I, in some ways this viz was a reclaiming of my own personal creative voice. And I like her. I like my own voice. I like me. Uh, it took a lot of therapy uh, things to get to that point, but like, I like me. So that's kind of what I learned. Um, uh, among also learning about like LODs, the, the, tile, the containers and all that stuff that comes from entering Iron Biz. So cool. If there's any more questions, I'm gonna, oops. Let's do it. I'm going to switch gears to lightning tips. Give me one second to drink some water. Okay, cool. We're ready. So can everyone see my screen? Say yes or no. Cool. I'm going to be super fast, I promise, because I know we're running out of time. Um, so first off, see this dashboard and using the Superstore data set. You know, I'm not sure about alignment, if I should play around with this. Um, you know, when I was first starting in Tableau, uh, especially as a data analyst, I was dinged a lot 
on, um, on alignment. And one of the reasons why I was dinged quite a bit in my early Tableau career on alignment was because I was eyeballing everything. So here is a fun little thing. It's super quick. If you, I can't, I don't know if it's this case for Mac, but if you're on Windows, if you press the G key, do you see that? There are grid lines. <sighs> Amazing. Um, once the grid lines are open, you can go into dashboard and adjust the grid options. The default is going to be 20. Um, I was practicing it, so sorry. But I personally like to do at a 25 increments. Um, each of the cues will then be 25 pixels. Um, I love grid lines. Press G to turn it off. And when you're done, press G to turn it off. Uh, my favorite. My absolute favorite. What I It came up because I was mad at Tableau, smacked my keyboard, and that's when I found out grid lines were a thing. So, um, and if I turn on my grid lines, you know, now we I'm going to put this to 50. Um, you know, kind of do the math to kind of figure out. Unfortunately, it's not like PowerPoint where it's kind of like automated and you kind of can pit pull. So, um, you know, I have it at 800 by 600 width. So I'm going to do increments of 25. You can also make it increments of 100. Totally up to you. Um, so yeah, next step, my tip number two is going to be ad hoc measures to the tool shelf. This is really great if you're doing something really quick and you're just kind of trialing something out. So I am just going to go to the columns. I'm going to double click. And there you go. You can just type in things. Um, for this case, I'm going to put like min to zero. And there you go, it's a static zero number. I could put that on rows so it looks more like a row. You can make it a bar. If you, I use this actually a lot for tooltips where, you know, the, the, the measure was min zero. So it's telling Tableau, like, don't add this measure across all the rows, just make it minimum aggregate of zero. Press, press circle. I could use my custom shapes. And there you go, you can have something floating. Um, and uh, sometimes I like, this saves me a couple of seconds, especially if it's just like, I just need to do a floating one or some measure instead of doing a calculated field. Um, so yeah, and then moving on to step three, which two kind of bleeds into three because if you guys can tell, I love it when things connect with each other. So. I did my thing. I put min 10. I put minimum five. So I am going to show you guys how I made those mood bar charts. Um, it's a simple uh, unit chart sometimes in Tableau can be kind of a lot. So this is kind of my hack for some for a really simple bar unit chart. So what I have here are two measures. One is set to 10 and one is set to five. I'm going to dual access it. It's actually really, if anyone's familiar with bullet graphs, it's really similar to a bullet graph. So I'm going to dual access this. From there, synchronize your, your axes because that's it's not fun when it happens. Um, so now that I have these two bars, right? You see that there's a five and you see that there's a 10. Um, I, could, I could walk away and that could be the end of it. But if I want to have that extra layer of customization, a little more finesse, one way that I like to do is I add reference lines to mock up a bar unit chart. So I don't have to put the text or anything. The way I do that is you go to analytics, you go down. I like to use reference line. I'm sure constant line works, but I like to use reference line. Only pick one measure to do this on. So I'm going to do 10. You're going to get this prompt. Um, you could you could do things value whatever, but since it's just going to be a constant, and this is really great for tooltips because there's not as much interaction. Um, I'm going to put it set to constant. It's going to automatically go to the max number, which will be ten. But for my case, you're going to do it for every single increment. So I'm going to put it at one. I'm going to format it. I'm going to remove the label, remove the tooltip because we don't want people to know this is a reference line. Um, I'm going to I'm going to increase the thickness of this line to like the fourth highest to really have that more differentiation. Um, make sure it's white. And then there you go. You got your first unit of a 10 unit bar chart. Just to repeat again, it's reference line, carry it to the same one. Uh, I'm going to do table under min 10. Uh, sorry, I always go to that value. Constant, go to two. Remove your value, remove your tooltip, do your formatting line, make sure it's the same level of thickness. 
because we love consistency. Make it white. And there you go. And you, re you repeat that across until 10. Um, what does it look like when you're formatting? This. And that is how, um, so you see, yes, the five out of 10 is still there, but you get to keep, um, and it's still a dual axis bar chart, but you like your end user gets to at a glance, even if this wasn't here, they could see that, oh, okay, it's halfway, 50%, five out of 10. Um, I wouldn't recommend this if your max for the unit is more than 10 because it gets super tedious after a while. And I say this as someone who's done this as a hack quite a bit. I general through rule of thumb, don't wanna do it more than 10. Um, there's probably other different ways, but if it's a really simple uh, mood bar chat, chart uh, hack, this is, this is how I do it. Um, and then finally, because finally for my final tip. So I went, so a little about me also, that's not covered on the Viz. Actually, it is in one of the tool tips. I challenge you to find it. I went to school for classical music, which means I fell in love with data a little not as linear of a path. So in, in exploring my Tableau journey, I, I've kind of figured out how to learn efficiently. And so for my final lightning tip, I kind of just want to give you guys, give you folks kind of like a, a, at least the approach that I do. So I kind of bucketed it off into three sections. For tutorials, there's a lot on for Tableau. And these three are not inclusive to everything out there, but I'm just stick, but these are the three that I tend to stick through. Tableau Magic and Tessellation, right, for their blogs, they're really direct and succinct about giving directions for creating these crazy intense complex charts or really things you're just trying to learn. I really enjoy their tutorials. And then the Information Lab, Information Lab, it has, um, that's who I go to when I need to watch something on YouTube. <laughs> that's usually my go-to. For my second bucket for terminology, I go to this Tableau chart catalog. Actually, there are people on the New York City Tug whose work is featured in this, um, which is pretty cool. So try to find it. Um, as someone who's not originally a data person and later found, found data as her second love, um, sometimes I don't know the name for things, which makes Googling how to do things really hard when you're Googling, how do I make this cool chart I found on Twitter? So I'll use this specific chart to find the, the terminology name for the chart that I'm looking for, and then kind of run off to the races on Google. To so finally, where I go for inspiration, I, it's a lot on Twitter. I don't really post a lot, but I'm probably lurking and looking through a lot of people's work. Not to be a creep. I hope I'm not a creep. I'm just a big fan. Um, the hashtags I tend to follow for like some inspiration look is usually hashtag data fam, hashtag viz inspiration, or vizpiration. I can't tell which is the spelling, so just kind of follow those and be happy about it. And then hashtag dig viz viz. Um, and that's it. That's the end of my, that's the end of my lightning tips. So cool. All right. A uh, big thank you to both of our presenters today. Um, I'm sure everyone is giving you a virtual round of applause. Those are two great presentations. Uh, Skylar popped in the chat about if you wanted to present at a future tug, anything Tableau, data viz related, um, go ahead and get in contact with us and be sure to follow us on social media, on Twitter and LinkedIn and subscribe to that user group page so that you get all future updates when we're gonna have more events. Hopefully we'll have at least one more by the end of the year for everyone. And um, with that, let's see, I don't see any like big questions coming in, people congratulating y'all. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining and we should hopefully see you again soon. Thank you.